Like just sold chalkboards up and stuff. And there was uh, the lady, her pastime was making dolls. And but she made these little dolls. Okay, off we go. We're going on an expedition with the class. We're going up the mountain, up Simpson's Road, and then we'll see from there. I guess we're going to the reservoir first. Yeah, true. That's cold, a good thing. Yeah, we should have camped. I have a tarp. I have a tarp. Yeah, so we could set the tarp up. I'm, I'm very serious. Let's camp next week. Come on. This is fucking fun. Next semester, when the winter, when the the winter ends, you're not going to be there. No, I well, I would come if you guys go camping. You can count on that. I'll be there. <laughs> okay, I'll try. There's some green stuff on my phone. <laughs> oh, shoot. Look, it's right there. When I used to work as a guide at the museum with the, for the day camp, the kids would come here. Okay. And we would, we would walk along this. Yeah. No, no, it's going to move to Grutz. I've been Grutz, so I'm going to. I have my knees, I see my headlight. And I have Glühwein, Glühwein had I made. Glühwein had I made, yeah, the first time. Ah, number 10, the half of the class, the other is not even coming. Yeah, it's good, it's just lustig, you know, you know, you know, you know, it's just lustig, yeah. Yeah. It's all good, yeah. Ah, ja, ja. Ich, ich habe mit dem Lehrer geredet und er hat gesagt, ah, die Socken, die Rainbow Socken sind am besten. Und dann mache ich das und es ist einfacher, weil ich weiß genau, wie ich es muss lesen. Nein, eine Socke ist schnell gemacht. Ich, muss einfach den, ich mache sie nicht exakt. Nein, sie müssen nicht beide gleich sein. Ich muss einfach den äh, Violett. Blau, grün, gelb. Hä? Äh? Nein, ich muss sie kaufen. Bleiben. Hast du Wolle? Hey, ja, was, was für Farbe hast du? Ja, nein, no, es passt doch wohl. Es ist ja nicht. Es ist ja nicht. Es muss ja nicht ein super Pass sein. Ja. Was für Farben das du hast. Das ist auch eine neue Farbe. Hast du gelb? Gelb hast du? Ah, die Kio gibt es muss ich. Ja. Okay. Du hast ja schon wieder eine Lenzocke machen, weißt du? Machst du Sinn? Oder? Und diese Socke mit dem elastischen Faden. Und diese Socke. Da wäre schon ewig gegangen, und das ist so fein. Aber das, das muss ich mal probieren. Das muss, das muss ich mal probieren. Eine so eine Socke machen, ganz mit dem Erasmus. Ich zeige das, ich, ich bringe es nicht zurück. Ich, ich, ich probiere es mal und ich zeige das, wie es ist. Wie der, der Vater ist so ein elastischer Vater, weißt du? 
Ja. Ja, ja. Ah, oh, hat er nichts zurückgebracht, der Löw? Okay. Okay. Hä? Nein, der Schuss mache ich. Das ist viel mehr Arbeit. Der Schuss machen und auch sticken ist viel mehr Arbeit. Das ist genau so. Okay. Ich mache es das Wochenende. Ich das Wochenende. Ja. Ja, und weißt du, die schönen Socken, die schönen Händchen bin ich für Schäden und Küsse, die habe ich verloren. Oh well, nicht okay. Ja, die sind schön, die ich so gerne kann. Er hat sie nicht angelegt und ich habe sie angelegt und jetzt sind sie verloren. Nein, ich weiß nicht. Nein, ich verloren sie. Nein. Anyways, okay, ich lasse dich gar nicht spielen. Ja, ja. Okay. A collective, yeah, we're doing a collective. We're getting there to the base of the mountain now. Almost at the park. And across the street, Dr. Penfield, and then we're going to go up. Okay, let's regroup. Hey guys, wait up. Wait for us. Okay, this is night exercise for big fat old mama going up the hill to get back in shape. That's okay. Running shoes, but not hiking shoes. Okay. That's okay. And for the candle. Where are they? Hey, you're, you're the one shining blue. blue. Okay, I get it. Points. And you use like landmarks and like there's clues, but then there's also like numbering on the maps based on like that's so. It's yeah, you have to go there in order. Yeah. Yeah, I did it once and then like so I like fun. I skipped one accidentally. I spent like an hour looking for it. Yeah, like and it can be like really hard, hard sometimes. Yeah. So if you skip one, you're missing both. Well, yeah, you have, well, I mean, you can, you can like, want. you can like finish it. The one I did, you can finish it like in any order. You like, yeah. you can skip one, but then you lose points. If you skip one, so you have to do them in like order. That's not the same as ours. Ours is like just trying to get all of them. And there was okay. like, there's like mandatory ones. Okay. Per, and they had a point value based on how hard they are to find. And my team won. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how you? Yeah, that's why. It was me and my girl. And she's a marathoner now. Oh, okay, yeah. She's like super fit. She's 4'10". She's tiny and she wins marathons. It's amazing. That's like usually like a lot of people. Usually they're tiny. She's just like... Take a water break at the top. And granola bars.
We're getting to the top. Boy, these people are in shape. This is a story of a young man, his name could be Boris, his name could be Alessandro, his name could be Enrique, and essentially he goes into a new town where he will set up shop, he's an artist, and he arrives in a town from Montreal. It's, uh, somewhere in the countryside but he arrives pretty late and he has to find lodging for the night and he just wants to go to a local inn but as he's walking to the local inn he he walks by a street which looks very um, you know um, dilapidated a bit but looks inhabited looks more for um, artist type people and as he's walking on the street towards the inn he passes by a window where he suddenly sees a sign that says bed and breakfast and it, that was not his initial goal he really wanted just to get to a local pub wow. local inn but he's intrigued because one minute he looks there's no sign and the next minute there's a sign and he's very compelled to actually knock on the door and see what's, what the lodgings are in the bed and breakfast. So he rings the doorbell and as soon as he rings the door opens and there's this old or well, middle-aged lady rather with um, red fingernails, funky hat, red lipstick, very sweet, eccentric, nice looking, even though a bit weird. and. She invites him in and he goes in. He he just can't resist. He goes in. And so she invites him in and he asks about the lodgings and realizes that it only costs 20 bucks for a night, which is probably much cheaper than a local inn or motel or whatever. And it's even including breakfast. Although if he wants supper, he has to pay a bit more. But that's fine by him. So she shows him to the room it's really nice he has a whole floor to himself there's no one else that's pretty odd and it almost seems like she was just waiting for him and she's very nice and as they're going upstairs he passes the living room he sees a nice fire in the fireplace he sees a little dog curled up on the carpet in front of the fireplace and a little parrot in the cage 
and it looks very warm and cozy. So he has a warm, fuzzy feelings and he sees his rooms, his room, the lady shows him. And then she tells him to come downstairs when he's freshened up and that she has some tea for him. And he really doesn't want to at first, but then he accepts the invitation. And then when he goes down, downstairs, he, um, she's not there. He's, he's in the living room alone. There's like a little side table and on the table there's a, a guest book, you know, a log book and he opens it up and he sees only two entries in the last three years and they're both names that are vaguely familiar of two young or two men, he doesn't know they're young, but, and one of them is Daniel and the other one is, and I don't know, Daniel from Montreal and Miroslav from, I don't know, from, from out west. And he looks at the names and yeah, he really wonders where he's seen those names, but he pushes the idea, their thoughts the side and there she comes in old lady all pampered up all sweet she brings in a tray of tree tea and biscuits cookies and she invites him to sit down by the fireplace and so yeah that's the first part of the story I'm gonna get back to it in a minute okay back to my story so um we were sitting by the fire, he was drinking his, sipping his tea, and they had a conversation that was really, really strange. She was, um, he was essentially asking her about those two, two, uh, two people who had stayed, who had stayed with her at the, at the, at the bread and breakfast, and she was sort of evasive, although she did mention that one of them had fantastic teeth, just like he did. And the other had beautiful skin, and he thought that was really odd. And then at one point, she said something really strange. She said, "Well, they're still living here on the fourth floor." And he just thought, "Well, she is not only eccentric; she is really crazy." But being polite, he just didn't push and ask more. But after a while, he, he had to ask. He was. Is that parrot is not alive, is it? And he was he was realizing that the parrot hadn't moved the whole time they were sitting there. And she said, Oh no, he's been dead for a while. And then he realized that it was a taxi taxi dermy Um the, uh, the the parrot had been preserved and that she was a taxidermist. She she even said that she had um, preserved the, the little dog. And so he was like, wow, he was amazed at her skills. But still, he should have thought, wow, this is really odd. And then slowly, it started to dawn on him. He was sipping this tree, had a strange, bitter taste, almond taste. And he started to click those two guys who had been there for... Who were still there in the inn. Oh no, had been there for so long it's been over two two years and three years for one of them he was essentially realizing these guys they they never left the place they they came in and they never left and then he asked her well didn't you ever have other guests and then she says no you're the last one in the last two years and, and well that's the end of the story thanked him and picked up his suitcase and set out to walk the quarter mile to the Best Western. He had never been to Saint-Sauveur before. He didn't know anyone who lived there, but Mr. Greenslade at the head office in Montreal had told him it was a splendid town. Find your own lodgings, he said, and then go along and report to the branch manager as soon as you've got yourself settled. Boris was 17, 17 years old. He was wearing a new navy blue overcoat, a new brown trilby hat, a new brown suit, and he was feeling fine. He walked briskly down the street. He was trying to do everything briskly these days. Briskness, he had decided, was 
the one common characteristic of all successful businessmen or artists, let's put. The big shots up at the head office were absolutely fantastically brisk all the time. They were amazing. There were no shops on this side, on the wide street that he was walking along, only a, a line of tall houses on each side, all of them identical. They had porches and pillars and four or five steps going up their front doors. And it was obvious that once upon a time they had been very swanky residences. But now, even in the darkness, he could see that the paint was peeling from the woodwork on their doors and windows and that the handsome white facades were cracked and blotchy from neg ne neglect. Suddenly, in a downstairs window that was brilliantly illuminated by a street lamp, not six yards away, Boris caught sight of a printed notice propped up against the glass in one of the upper panes. It said, bed and breakfast. There was a vase of yellow chrysanthemums tall and beautiful standing just underneath the notice. He stopped walking, he moved a bit closer, green curtains were hanging down on either side of the window. The chrysanthemums looked wonderful beside them. He went right up and peered through the glass into the room and the first thing he saw was a bright fire burning in the earth. Hearth. On the carpet in front of the fire, a pretty little dachshund was curled up asleep with its nose tucked into its belly. The room itself, so far as he could see in the half-darkness, was filled with pleasant furniture. There was a baby grand piano and a big sofa and several plump armchairs, and in one corner he spotted a large parrot in a cage. Animals were usually a good sign in a place like this, Boris told himself. All in all, it looked to him as though it would be a pretty decent house to stay in. Certainly it would be more comfortable than the Best Western. On the other hand, a pub or hotel would be more congenial than a boarding house. There would be beer and darts in the evening and lots of people to talk to and it would probably be a good bit cheaper too. He had stayed a couple of nights in a pub once before and he had liked it. After dithering about like this in the cold for two or three minutes, Billy decided, oh, Billy, Boris, decided that he would walk on and take a look at the at the Best Western before he made up his mind. He turned to go and now a queer thing happened to him. He was in the act of stepping back and turning away from the window when all at once his eye was caught and held in the most peculiar manner by the small notice that, that was there. Bed and breakfast, it said, bed and breakfast, bed and breakfast, bed and breakfast. Each word was like a large black eye staring at him through the glass, holding him, compelling him, forcing him to stay where he was and not to walk away from that house. And the next thing he knew, he was actually moving across from the window to the front door of the house, climbing the steps that led up to it and reaching for the bell. He pressed the bell. Far away in a back room, he heard it ringing. And then at once, it must have been at once because he hadn't even had time to take his finger from the bell button. The door swung open and a woman was standing there. Normally you ring the bell and you have at least half a minute before the door opens, but this day was like a jack-in-the-box. He pressed the bell and out she popped. She was about 45. And the moment she saw him, she gave him a warm, welcoming smile. Please come in, she said pleasantly. She stepped aside, holding, holding the door wide open, and Morris found himself notice in the window he said holding himself back yes I know I was wondering about a room it's all ready for you my dear he said. she had a brown face and very gentle blue eyes I was on my way to the best western Boris told her but the notice in your window just happened to catch my eye Egg and bacon for breakfast. A lot of weird Eggs are expensive at the moment. You know, like, it would be a dollar less without the egg. Twenty dollars is fine, he answered. I should very much like to stay here. I knew you would. Do come in. She seemed terribly nice. She looked exactly like the mother of one's best school friend welcoming one into the house to stay for Christmas holidays. Boris took off his hat and stepped over the pressure. Yeah, yeah, keep going. I want to know what happened. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
know just what hang in there. Sh hang in there, she said. <laughs> Let me help you with your coat. Oh, yeah, it bothers you. Yeah. Sorry. There were no other hats or coats in the hall. There were no umbrellas, no walking sticks, nothing. We have it all to ourselves, she said, oh, smiling she at him over her shoulder at the, as she led the way upstairs. You see, it's it very often I have the pleasure of asking a visitor into the nest. Uh, <laughs> the old girl is, a slight, is slightly dotty, uh, Boris told himself. But at five and, oh, at $20 a night, who gives a damn about I should should have thought you'd be simply swamped, swamped with applicants, he said politely. Oh, I am, my dear, I am. Of course I am, but the trouble is that I'm inclined to be just a teeny weeny bit choosy in particular, if you see what I mean. Oh, yes. But I'm always ready. Everything is always ready. I'm always ready. I'm always ready. Just on the off chance that an acceptable young gentleman, gentleman will come along, and it is such a pleasure, my dear, such a very great pleasure, when now and again I of Boris's body to his feet and then up again. On the second floor landing, she said to him, this floor is mine. They climbed up another flight and this was all yours. She said, here's your room. I hope you'd like it. She took it into a small but charming front bedroom, twi switching on the lights as she did. no question about that, but she was also quite obviously a kind and generous soul. He guessed that she had probably lost a son in the war or something like that and had never gotten over it. So a few minutes later, after unpacking his suitcase and washing his hands, he trotted downstairs to the ground floor. Oh, and the living room, his landlady was there, the, but the fire was glowing yeah. in the earth, there was like the and the little duck swan was still sleeping soundly in front of it. The room was wonderfully warm and cozy. I am a lucky fellow, he thought rubbing his hands. This is a bit of a, a bit of all right. He found the guest book lying open on the piano. So he took out his pen and wrote down his name and address. There were only two other entries above his on the page. As one always does with guest books, he started to read them. One was Miroslav from Victoria. unusual name before. Was it a boy at school? No. Was it one of his sister's numerous young men? Perhaps. Or friends of his father's? No, no, it wasn't any of those. He glanced down again at the book. As a matter of fact, now beginning to think of it, he wasn't at all 
sure that the second game, Alessandro, had, 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 uh, didn't have almost as much of a new ring about it as the first. Alessandro, he said out loud, searching his memory. Miroslav, such charming boys, a voice behind him answered. And he turned and saw his landlady sailing into the room with a large silver tea tray in her hands. She was holding it well out in front of her and rather high up, as though the tray were a pair of reins on a frisky horse. They sound somehow familiar, he said. They do. How interesting. I'm almost positive I've heard those names before somewhere. Isn't that odd? Maybe it was in the newspapers. They weren't famous in any way, or were they? I mean, famous artists or... Uh, Something like that. Famous, she said. Before that, more than three years ago. Dear me, she said, shaking her head and heaving a dainty little sigh. I would never have thought it. How time does fly from, all, from us all, doesn't it, Mr. Wilkins? It's Dumenil. D U S N E N I L. <laughs> oh, of course it is, she cried, sitting down on the sofa. How silly of me, I do apologize. In one ear, out the other. That's me, Mr. All this? No, dear, I don't. Well, you see, both of these names, Miroslaw and a uh, Alessandro, I not only seem to remember each one of them separately, so to speak, but somehow or other, in some peculiar way, they both appear to be some sort of connected together as well, as though they were both famous for the same sort of thing, if you see what I mean. Yes, it's exactly what I mean. No? No. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, um... You saw that? Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, you saw it. Whoa. So like, <laughs> no, no. So creepy. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> oh, how amusing. But come over here now, dear, and sit down beside me on the sofa, and I'll give you a nice cup of tea yeah, yeah. and a ginger tea before you go to bed. You really should bother, boys said. I didn't mean to do anything like that. I didn't mean you to do anything like that. You stood by the down and watched the person fussed about with the cups and stuff. Positive it was in the newspaper papers I saw them, Boris said. I'll think it of it in a second. I'm sure I will. There is nothing tantalizing, more tantalizing than a thing like this that lingers just outside the border of one's memory. He hated to give up. Now wait a minute. Just a minute. Miroslav, wasn't that the name of the Victoria School boy? Fire. Come on, your tea's all, all ready for you. She patted the empty place beside her on the sofa and she sat there smiling at Boris and waiting for him to come over. Across the room, slowly and sat down on the edge of the sofa, she placed his teacup on the table in front of him. There we are, she said. How nice and cozy this is, isn't it? Boris stared, started sipping his tea. She did the same. For half a minute or so, neither of them spoke. But Boris knew that he was looking at him that she was looking at him. Her body was half turned toward him and he could feel her eyes resting on his face, watching him over the rim <laughs> of her teacup. Now and again, he caught a whiff of a peculiar smell that seemed to emanate directly from the person. Pickled walnuts, new leather, or was it the corridors of a hospital? At length, he said, uh, Miroslav was a great one for his tea. Never in my life have I seen anyone drink as much tea as, as, as dear, sweet Miroslav. I suppose he left fairly recently, Boris said. He was still puzzling his head about the two names. He was positive now that he had seen them in the newspaper, in the headlines. Left, she said, arcing her eyebrows. But my dear boy, he never left. 
he's still here. Oh shit. Uh, um, <laughs> Alessandro is also here. They're oh, on the fourth oh. floor, oh, both of them <laughs> together. Boris set his cup down slowly on the table and stared at his landlady. She smiled back at him and then she put out one of her white hands and patted him comfortably on the knee. Oh, How old are you, my dear? She asked. Mm. Seventeen. Seventeen. Oh, it's the perfect age. Miroslav was also seventeen, but I think he was a trifle shorter than me. In fact, I'm sure he was, and his teeth weren't quite as so white. You, you have the most beautiful teeth, uh, Mr. Dumini. Did you know that? They're not as good as they look, <laughs> Boris said. <laughs> <laughs> simply masses of filling in them at the back. And I can't even smile. My mouth is full of <laughs> <laughs> Alessandro, of course, was a little older, she said, ignoring his mm -hmm. remark. He was actually 28. <laughs> and yet, I would never have guessed it if you hadn't told me. Never in my whole life there wasn't a blemish on his body. What? On his body? Okay. His skin okay. was just like a baby's. <laughs> there was a pause. <laughs> Boris picked up his teacup and took another sip of his tea. Then he set it down again gently into its saucer. He waited for her to say something else, but she seemed to have lapsed into another of her silences. He sat there staring, staring straight ahead of him into the far corner of the room, biting his lower lip. That parrot, he said at last, you know something? It had me completely fooled when I first saw it in the, through the window. I could have sworn it was a parrot in the beginning of the cage. I could have sworn it was alive. Alas, no longer. It's most terribly clever the way it's been done, he said. It doesn't look in the least bit dead. Who did it? I did. You did? <laughs> of course. And have you met my little Basil as well? She nodded toward the dachshund curled up so comfortably in front of the fire. Boris looked at it and suddenly he realized that the animal had all the time been just silent and motionless as a parrot. He put out a hand and touched it gently on the top of its back. The back was and when he pushed the hair, it's almost finished, in one side of his fingers, he could see the skin underneath, grayish, black, and dry, perfectly preserved. Good gracious, he said, how absolutely fascinating. He turned away from the dog and stared in deep, with deep admiration at the little woman beside him on the sofa. It be, must be most awfully difficult to move. Not in the best, she said. I stuff all my little pets myself when they pass away. Will you have another cup? Oh, no, thank you, Boris said. The tea tasted faintly of bitter almonds, and he didn't care much for it. You did find the book, didn't you? Oh, yes. That's good, because later on, if I happen to forget what you were called, then I could always come down here and look it up. I still do that almost every day with Miss Miroslav and Alessandro. Alessandro, Boris said. Alessandro, excuse my asking, but have there been any other guests here except them in the last two or three years? Holding her teacup high in one hand, inclining her head slightly to the left, she looked up at him out of the corners of her eyes and gave him another gentle little smile. No, my dear, only you. End of story. Yes, like a movie. Tricks? Oh my. Yeah, I'll, I'll do tricks for sure. Yeah, I'll do tricks. Yes, maybe.
Yeah, the parking is that, that way, I think. I like, I like this way. So, it's like, it's nice and wide, and you're just walking. I'm really pissed about my cigarette pack. You'll probably find that later. No, but I, I don't have anywhere else to put it. Did I don't you, think I put it in my pocket. I think I dropped it. Oh, shit. Oh, God, I'm so pissed. You smoke a lot? Yeah. Well, no, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. I don't. But sometimes when I'm walking like that, I want to smoke. Mm. I don't think I want to smoke in a car. I've never smoked a cigarette to myself, I don't think. You don't drink? I've never smoked a cigarette to myself. I definitely drink. Okay. <laughs> Well, half a minute or so, neither of them spoke. But Boris knew that he was 